Now that we've learned the squeeze theorem, we can use it to evaluate a very famous limit. Today, we'll be using the squeeze theorem and a geometric argument to find the limit of sine of theta over theta as theta approaches zero. This is one of those limits for a calculus class that you're typically expected to memorize. But before we memorize the limit, let's see why it's true. Again, we're going to use the squeeze theorem. So we're gonna need to squeeze sine of theta over theta between two things. We don't know what those things are going to be, but it turns out they're going to come from this geometric construction. Let's walk through it. Here is a unit circle, and for any angle theta, we could draw a line from the origin passing through the circle that has an angle of theta with the x-axis. We're, of course, considering this angle theta approaching zero. So we're imagining it shrinking and approaching zero. And since we're in the first quadrant, right now we're thinking about theta approaching zero from the right. But as we'll see, the argument will apply from the left as well. So we will have a valid argument for the two-sided limit. So for any angle theta, we have this unit circle. We can draw the segment that creates an angle of theta with the x-axis, and we can draw it far enough to intersect the line that's tangent to the circle at the point one zero. Then we can also connect that point one zero to the point where the segment intersects the circle. That gives us this purple segment there. Now, this gives us three shapes, which we're going to use to do our squeezing. The smallest shape is this triangle. And then the second smallest shape is this sector of the circle. This is going to be squeezed in the middle. Thus, that's where our sine theta over theta is going to come into play. And then our biggest shape is this outer triangle that goes out to the tangent line. Here are those three shapes and their areas. I'll talk about their areas in a second, but let me just make sure you see where these shapes are coming from. There's the biggest shape, that outer triangle. Here is the middle shape, the sector of the circle. And then here is the smallest shape, which is that inner triangle. All right, now let's talk about their areas. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. So looking at this big triangle, its base is one because this is coming from a unit circle and its height is tangent theta. Because if we take the tangent of theta here, well, that's going to be the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. The opposite side is just the height of the triangle, and the adjacent side is the radius of the unit circle, which is 1. So the tangent is just the height of the triangle. So its area is 1 half times the base of 1 times the height, which is tangent theta. This triangle over here, its area is 1 half base of 1, because again, unit circle, and its height is sine theta, because its height is the distance from the x-axis to that opposite vertex, and of course, that distance is just the y-coordinate of the point. The y-coordinate of this point on the unit circle is sine theta. Sine theta is just the opposite side, this height that we're talking about, divided by the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is this, which is the radius of a unit circle, which is just one. So sine theta is the height. So one half sine theta is the area of that triangle. And then for the sector, the area is radius squared, which is just one squared, times the angle that's cutting the sector, which is theta, and then divided by two. That's because the area of a circle is pi r squared. So the area of a sector is just whatever portion of the area the angle cuts. And the portion of the area the angle cuts can be found by taking the angle and dividing by how many radians there are total in a circle. So it's theta over 2 pi, because that's the proportion of the circle that exists in this sector, and then multiply that by the area of a circle. Of course, the pi's cancel out, and the formula turns out to be radius squared times theta over 2. And that's what you see here. 
All the hard work is done. Let's get into the inequality and finish the argument. Again, this construction is all in the first quadrant, so we do need to assume here that theta is greater than zero, but we'll see shortly how the argument also applies when theta is approaching zero from the negative direction. Now we know that this biggest triangle has an area of tangent theta over two which is certainly greater than or equal to the area of the sector, which is theta over 2, and the area of the sector is certainly greater than or equal to the area of that smaller triangle that it contains, and that area is sine theta over 2. Looking back at the figure, you can see how the big triangle contains the sector, which contains the small triangle. So that's how we get this inequality. Then we would like our function sine theta over theta to be in the middle because we're trying to use the squeeze theorem on it. So let's multiply everything by two to get rid of that half, and then we'll divide by sine theta. That way we'll have theta over sine theta. That's not exactly what we want, but we can just flip everything afterwards to finish it up. So multiplying everything by two over sine theta, on the left, that gets rid of the denominator of two, and then we have tangent theta divided by sine theta. Tangent theta is sine theta over cosine theta, so the sine thetas cancel out, and we're just left with one over cosine theta. In the middle, the denominator of two cancels out, Theta is still in the numerator, but now we have a sine theta in the denominator. On the right, the twos cancel out and the sines cancel out, and so we just have one. Since theta is approaching zero from the positive direction as well, we know that sine theta is positive, so we didn't have to flip the inequalities when we did this multiplication, because we're multiplying by a positive number. Now we'll just want to invert the whole inequality so that we have sine theta over theta instead of the other way around. When we invert the whole inequality, we have to flip the direction of the signs. So now it's less than or equal to, less than or equal to. No problem, our desired function is still in the middle. Theta over sine theta gets inverted to sine theta over theta. One over cosine theta gets inverted to cosine theta, and the inverse of one is just one. So now we have this inequality. But what's great about this inequality is that it most definitely holds for theta approaching zero, not only from the positive direction, but also from the negative direction. That's because cosine is an even function. So if theta is positive and we consider what happens when we hit it with a negative, well, the value of cosine doesn't change. Cosine of theta is the same as cosine negative theta because cosine is an even function. On the other hand, sine is an odd function. So theta is positive, and we might ask, what happens if we hit it with a negative? Well, sine of negative theta divided by negative theta, we're imagining that theta is approaching from the negative direction now, well, that would just be sine theta over theta because sine of negative theta is negative sine theta. So all that happens is the negatives cancel out. Just to show you that intermediate step, this is the same as negative sine theta because sine is an odd function divided by negative theta. The negatives would cancel out and it's still just sine theta over theta. So even if theta were approaching from the negative direction, approaching zero from the left, this inequality would still hold. The values would all be exactly the same. So, as we just argued, this inequality holds for all non-zero theta from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So, we're sticking in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant. The other quadrants aren't relevant because we're approaching zero. So, certainly, this area is not meaningful. But clearly, this inequality is valid no matter how we approach zero. So, we can now apply the squeeze theorem. The limit of cosine theta, this lower bound as theta approaches zero is one. You can just plug zero in. Cosine of zero is one. And of course, the limit of one as theta approaches zero, this upper bound, is also one. Thus, sine theta over theta is getting squeezed between one and one. By the squeeze theorem, the limit of sine theta over theta as theta approaches zero must equal one.
There is one more look at the details of the argument if you wanted to revisit any of them. I hope you found that a clear explanation. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. With this newly discovered limit, we can actually prove another trig limit. We can prove that the limit of one minus cosine x over x as x approaches zero is zero. And I'll let you give it a try yourself. We'll do the proof next time. Thanks for watching.